Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's ISC webinar, which we're bringing in partnership with Simon and Adam from Modern Hire. Um, I'll hand over to Simon and, and Adam shortly and we'll, we'll get cracking. But just a few pointers from me. I'm Steve Isherwood, Chief Executive of the ISC, and I'll be sort of emceeing the, the session today. Um, we'd like to make this as interactive as possible. So um, this is particularly the kind of topic we're going to be talking about bias, how you battle bias with data. Um, this is the kind of subject that will generates lots of ideas and lots of questions so please pop those into the chat pop them into the Q&A and I'll be keeping an eye on those as we go through and we should have um, 10 minutes or so at the end where um, I'll be able to put those questions to, to, to Simon and, and, and Adam. Um, we'll also be recording the session as we always do with all our with all our webinars um, so you will get a link to that so you can actually go back and revisit anything that you think you've missed um, but also actually we're very keen to, to, to share our knowledge around the industry so please feel free to pass that link on as well when you get it so that we can um, we can share share um share, share the knowledge and the learnings from today we often find that actually we get almost three or four times as many people who watch um watch our webinars on on catch up rather than live which i think is a symptom of just how busy everybody is at the moment which is the perfect segue to say let's get stuck into actually the content of today's session i'm um, really looking forward to it it's the second one we've done with with modern hire and the last one was really um, um rich and informative and i'm sure this one will be exactly much exactly the same and of course a very um a subject that's very um very present in our industry at the moment so simon can i hand over to you first of all to take it from here yes yeah, certainly thank you very much Stephen, and uh, good afternoon ladies and gentlemen thank you very much uh, for joining us here today so welcome to today's session uh, battling bias with data a winning approach to reducing bias in graduate and early careers hiring so if you've got an interest um, in artificial intelligence or ai uh, data ethical assessment uh, uh, and and more broadly we hope to provide you with uh, some uh, useful and practical insights today um so obviously we've we've done webinars before so if you joined us previously thank you very much and hopefully we can provide you with some uh, some some insights today as um Stephen already mentioned uh, just a couple of sort of points of, of, of mine housekeeping we do have the kind of the q a function at the bottom i'm sure after over two years now of remote working etc um you're used to using that so please don't stand on ceremony we're going to have a q a section at the end but just pop your um questions in the chat the moment they come to you um, the other thing I just want to add as well is that my email address is going to be provided at the very end of the session um, for any follow up. So um, for any kind of those burning questions, if you're anything like me that come to you the moment after you've left the conversation today. But we have lots of white papers, collateral um, and, and lots of further information as well. If you'd be interested, always happy to kind of keep the conversation going. So by way of a very quick introduction, uh, my name is Simon Davis. I'm the Solutions Director for EMEA here at Modern Hire. I'm a, a business psychologist by background, essentially. Uh, I'm lucky enough to be joined by my colleague, Adam Gretton, Regional Sales Manager for EMEA as well. Um, and before we get onto the good stuff, uh, talking about battling bias, um, I want to just provide you with a very brief intro to, to who we are at Modern Hire and what we do, because I appreciate there may be some variable levels of understanding. So just uh, very quickly before we get into the, the meat of the issue. Hey everyone, thanks Simon for that intro. So yeah, so, so Modern Hire, just to quickly introduce you to us if you don't know us, um, we're a global technology platform provider and we specialise in selection and assessment. So everything we do at Modern Hire is grounded in what we call the four E's of hiring that you can see on the screen here. Um, think of this as our why, this is why we're here, this is why clients work with us. And each of these four E's represents uh, potential challenges or blockers to a successful selection and assessment campaign. And maybe some of these speak to your experience. So when we think about efficiency, you know, we're looking at speeding things up um, and making recruiters more productive. One of the biggest challenges our clients tell us about from their recruitment teams is, you know, the need to do more with less as they're expected to sift enormous volumes of candidates on a case-by-case -case basis, often uh, completely manually. So, you know, optimising, streamlining and generally creating efficiencies is the name of the game here. That's the central need. And we've supported our clients in reducing their time to offer, um, as well as cutting recruitment admin via automation. Effectiveness, really, we're talking about quality of hire here. Um, so new hires that will perform better and stick around longer. So it's asking the question, you know, are we assessing what we think we're assessing? Are we hitting the nail on the head? And I'm sure um, you're all acutely aware of uh, the cost of a bad hire. And perhaps less obvious is calculating the costs associated with unexpected or 
premature turnover. So ethics at a basic level, this means complying with the various laws around the world, as well as supporting the various uh, diversity and inclusion initiatives our clients have. Um, and some recent case studies show uh, clients with using modern hire have been able to improve their uh, ethnic diversity by 40% and gender diversity by 25% of their new hires. And you know, from an ethical point of view, we try and go beyond the, the basics of legal compliance. And as an example, we contribute to ethical standards for artificial intelligence across the industry. And then last of the four E's is engaging. So what we're talking about here is a really strong candidate experience, but balancing that with a seamless and easy recruiter and manager experience. You know, graduates, we're, we're talking about digital natives now, they haven't known anything else. And, you know, far from experiencing the tedium and frustration of dial-up internet and wobbly search engines, those of us with a few gray hairs will remember, you know, grads are used to apps that work. You know, they're apps that are simple, effective, and just work every single time. So our assessments have got to reflect that. We can't lose talent because of shaky algorithms and unresponsive tech. So if the uh, four E's are our why, without sounding too much like Simon Sinek, then cognition, our science, uh, technology and optimization are our how. So we have over 45 advanced degree psychologists and data scientists uh, that design, implement and validate uh, our assessments. So we conduct over 30 million assessments and interviews every year. And we're constantly looking to optimize, iterate and improve to make sure we stay on top of an ever changing talent landscape. We understand that a one size fits all solution simply won't work with everything that is changing within the, the industry. And finally, on the outermost ring, we have our what. So what specifically does the platform offer? So these are the products we use to deliver on the, the four E's. So starting at 12 o'clock at the top, we've got text screening for those killer questions. We've got realistic previews, virtual job tryouts, which is our form of assessment. We've got on-demand or asynchronous interviews. We've got scheduling and live interviews. So if you bring that all together, you've got our intelligent hiring platform. And where we fit in um, is from the point that the candidate has applied, through to you making a decision on that candidate. So that way we pick up the heavy lifting, think of us as the selection and assessment engine for that part of your candidate funnel. Um, and we're not taking away the important face-to-face -face interactions that you can use to put your best foot forward as an employer. Lots of lovely clients. Here, here are some of the clients that we're grateful to, to work with. Um, it's not just about us bragging here, um, but also to show how across all these different verticals and industries, there are unique challenges, uh, considerations and needs that we need to respond to. So as Simon said, it's, it's it can never be a one size fits all approach. And finally, we're fortunate um, enough to work with half of the Fortune 100, give you an idea of the scale, um, and we're operating in over 200 countries and territories. Okay, thank you very much, Adam. So what we'll do without further ado is we'll move on to the, the slightly more interesting side of things. Of course, we, what it, and we have to start, of course, with what is bias? Of course, we cannot hope to possibly battle bias successfully if we can't first define it accurately. So, of course, I'm sure you're already recognizing the image on screen there, but we can trace our interest in bias and decision-making back to the work of uh, Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky. Um, and their seminal research into human decision making. So Kahneman distilled his research into his best selling works, which you can see on the right hand side of your screen there, Thinking Fast and Slow. I'm sure many of you have got a copy of this. It's very informative, a little bit dry in places, um, I'll be honest, but um, there's a lot of rich information there. And of course, Kahneman very famously won uh, the Nobel Prize in economics for his work. So in short, biases are essentially shortcuts in our thinking. They're evolved proclivities, um, evolved to keep us safe. Sometimes they're known as heuristics because they're practical, quick, they're number crunching techniques, broad rules of thumb, essentially. So they're great for rough estimates, but they're not always accurate, optimal or even rational, unfortunately. And so they help us with four primary functions um, to help us remember important information, of course, create meaning, to sift information when there is too much and to act fast, ultimately. And of course, we all possess 
these particular biases, which we come to rely on, um, particularly in those instances of amb ambiguity and uncertainty. Okay, so many of you will recognize this particular wheel that you now see on there, don't worry, I don't expect you to be able to read all of it, and I'm definitely not going to be quizzing you on, uh, on recalling any of it, um, but the Cognitive Bias Codex uh, details dozens of different cognitive biases, you can find it online, I believe, if you just search on Wikipedia, it'll come up, um, and all of these biases you can see on screen here have been observed scientifically to different degrees. As I mentioned, we rely on our biases to perform four major functions, um, but our reliance on these often becomes exacerbated in times of fatigue, in times of stress, uncertainty, and as I mentioned a moment ago, in ambiguity in particular. They're suited to our evolutionary nature to make simple decisions fast, but not so much when it comes to, say, making far more complex decisions in, say, the world of selection and assessment in the age of, well, in, in 2022. Um, we can achieve suboptimal outcomes um, if we rely on these. Um, in more recent years, bias has taken on a bit of a sort of a miasmatic, a mysterious quality often um, that becomes increasingly imprecise. It's almost like catching smoke sometimes the way it's been defined or indeed redefined. Um, bias is often used as a value judgment or an explanatory technique as to why, let's say, as an example, certain demographics haven't gone through an assessment um, process successfully. This is not what we mean here, particularly. Um, what we mean is imprecise human decision making that is quantifiable, observable, and therefore we are able to create suitable interventions. Biases uh, have evolved to help make decisions, as I mentioned, um, but can do so suboptimally. So in the context of selection and assessment, we mean selecting or not selecting candidates using suboptimal criteria such as proxies, Type one errors, that is seeing things that aren't there. We often talk about mistaking confidence for competence and also type two errors so missing things that are there. You know, we've we, we've heard a lot and indeed modern hire have talked a lot about, um, you know, assessing people's potential rather than past performance, because if you're only looking at what's gone on in the CV, you're going to miss some really good people. And that's what we mean by essentially a broad type two error. OK, so our very first takeaway, and it kind of goes without saying, really, that humans are indeed bias machines. Um, we often hear sometimes we hear about completely bias free forms of assessment. Me personally, I'm speaking from a personal standpoint now, um, I don't believe there's, there's any such thing because, of course, anything containing humans will indeed incur a degree of bias. But what we can do is look to mitigate bias as best as humanly possible, control for proxies, control for things that are less relevant. Um, and make sure that we can create a fair and ethical process. So there is lots going on in the space at the moment. And what I'd like to do is, don't think it would be, we, we'd have a fair crack at the whip um, if we didn't start to map out and understand what is being done presently um, and what that might look like. So I'm gonna pass back over to Adam now for the state of bias in hiring. Brilliant, thanks Simon. You can move on, thanks. Yeah, so one thing we've noticed, and I'm sure you have too, if, if you're not already doing it yourself, is the replacement of culture fit with culture ad. And I um, always like to turn to Dilbert for a, a bit of wisdom. Um, and, you know, moving to culture ad is recognising that culture fit can be code for hiring people just like us. And, you know, you, you're attending this webinar, so I don't think I need to lecture you on why that's not a great idea, otherwise you probably wouldn't be here. Um, you know, but we know that, um, you know, culture fit, hiring people like us can lead to groupthink, and it can even, in extreme examples, lead to toxic cultures. Um, and the flip side, you know, we know that diversity leads to higher levels of innovation and better company performance. However, you know, sometimes you need to bring other people on that journey with you. Um, they may not always appreciate the value that diversity and inclusion brings to your bottom line. You know, it may sometimes feel like a nice to have or part of a CSR initiative. And that's where data like this can, can help. And, you know, as you can see, it shows that companies have, that have more diverse executive teams have higher financial performance. I, couldn't help including a Lego slide there. One of my clients always like to crowbar them in uh, wherever I can. It always puts a smile on people's um, face. But yeah, I mean, going back to the data, you know, according to McKinsey, companies with diverse leadership teams, they attain 73% more in revenue from innovation than less diverse companies. 
and 33% um, more likely to outperform on profitability as well. So, you know, that tells us diversity of perspectives simply yields better results. It gives you unique viewpoints and new and better innovations, it gives you creative solutions and increased profits. And uh, we always like to try and um, add in a little bit of sort of some takeaway information and things like that. So one of the, one of the great books, if you if you if you're like me, you, you enjoy a good read. Um, we'd recommend is a, is a book by Matthew Saeed called Rebel Ideas, in which he juxtaposes and considers the importance of both demographic diversity and also diversity of thoughts. Um, and the salient point being really as practitioners, uh, you know, it, it, it behooves us um, as practitioners to try and reduce the opportunity for bias to maximise various forms of diversity and ensure equal opportunities in the hiring process as well. Brilliant. So yeah, so looking at this slide, there's quite a lot of information on the screen, but what we're looking at from left to right is we're trying to demonstrate the evolution of interviewing and assessment. So historically on the left, lots of inconsistency. You know, now it's time to create practical, scalable and fair assessments using AI. Uh, so bars or behaviorally anchored rating scales um, for fairness and standardization, you know, they, they remain the best practice approach. So why can't we use AI to augment that which already works? So Josh Burson, many of you will be familiar with, uh, a particularly influential uh, thought leader in this space, overlays this model with, with various system evolutions, as, uh, as, as he refers to it. So in the 1970s and the 1980s, you, you genuinely had systems of record. So the most important thing back then was to just make sure you had a functional system in which you were able to, to document um, all of your candidates and, and their progress uh, through your assessment, which is kind of uh, it's quite wild when you think about it, really, that that was kind of the, the, the main point of interest. Um, that evolved, of course, in the 1990s and the 2000s with the emergence of systems of talent. And of course, I'm sure you're all familiar with. And again, probably another another book on many of your shelves, which would have been The War for Talent, uh, of course, coming out around about that time, incredibly influential. We also had in the 2010s onwards, we had systems of engagement. So building from that systems of talent um, where things like mobile and social interfacing, attraction and comms and candidate experience generally took a front seat um, at the table uh, when it came to uh, assessing talent. Now, in the 2010s and beyond, uh, sorry, the 2020s and beyond, I should say, um, systems of intelligence have started to, uh, to inform more and more of our thinking uh, as we go forward. So building on the systems of engagement, the focus now is on how we can use increasingly sophisticated um, intelligence models to leverage um, those candidate interactions and how we can make every each and every interaction easier and better, so more well-informed, essentially. So now we're going to look at some existing solutions to potential bias that use an intelligence-based approach. So I always think it's a good idea to start with what the candidates think. Um, so Modern Hire explored candidate perceptions of assessment. And one vital requirement for achieving a fairer assessment process is the mitigation of cognitive bias. And we found that perceptions of bias amongst candidates um, were high, but the emerging systems of intelligence like AI and its more sophisticated approach to data analysis um, could hold the solution. You know, with any rise in technology, there are concerns, particularly surrounding bias, fairness and transparency. So are computer algorithms and artificial intelligence suitable to assess candidates and to inform their career opportunities ultimately. And there is a particularly interesting documentary produced by BBC Three, Computer Says No, I'm sure some of you have seen that. And this explores the potentially damaging influence of the misapplication or inappropriate application of AI in hiring. And the documentary, it centers largely on facial recognition AI and its application to hiring and indeed firing decisions. Um, and gamification of assessments is also considered from an accessibility um, standpoint. And then more recently, this is just from three weeks ago, Cambridge University published a report that also focuses mainly on facial analysis. So, you know, the advent of AI and big data has shined a light on bias that may exist in society. And as AI becomes increasingly powerful, it assumes greater control, and that does bring greater risk to humanity. 
So it has become apparent that many algorithmic systems contain embedded biases that um, impact um, people everywhere. So how do candidates feel? I would like to go back to candidates again. What, how do they feel about using these technologies in the hiring process? So, I mean, what we see is a really tremendous opportunity for education and communication. And as you can see here, the vast majority of candidates, 82%, believe they should be informed ahead of time if they're gonna be interacting with AI during the hiring process. So when you think about creating a process that's transparent and authentic, and also meeting candidate expectations, this is a big part. So we recommend being upfront with your candidates when you're using these types of technologies. And one of our most notable findings was that only 6% of candidates are comfortable with facial recognition in the hiring process. This is a technology that gets a lot of buzz in the marketplace, but the candidate appetite and uh, the science for it isn't there. So one of the central issues um, of, of using the, uh, you know, more modern, maybe um, quite marketable ideas like facial recognition is the quality of data that it draws upon. We're going to, in a little while, talk about the difference between black box and, and, and glass box thinking ultimately. Um, but one of the kind of the key takeaways that we'd like to unpack and share is this idea that in order to create a fair and ethical assessment um, in the age of intelligence and indeed in, in, in any of the stages we've talked about before with things like bars, etc., we have to improve the quality of the data or the input um, that we're using. So I appreciate there's a lot of information on screen here, but working from left to right, you can see a few examples of the different data sources that may be drawn upon. Um, from poorest on the left all the way through to the highest quality on the right hand side. So looking at the incidental column to start with, you can see how things like social media scraping, facial features from facial recognition and prosody, um, the sound of voice, the way that all of this has been used. Unfortunately, um, you know, many of these things are often or invariably not job related. Um, they are often unproven and sometimes invasive to collect as well. So what we want to try and do is improve the overall job relatedness of our data source, the ease of interpretation. We don't want any ambiguity in the way that we inter this information and to increase the overall predictive density um, of our approach as well. And predictive density essentially is just a very flowery way of saying that we're taking things that we know are predictive and we're combining them um, to add a lot of weight to the decisions that we're making ultimately. And you can see on the right hand side, this intentional approach using proven predictive values from structured and unstructured sources. And this is the kind of the key thing. We've mentioned AI already, um, but essentially AI is just, I always like the line by our EVP, Eric uh, Seidel, um, who just says that AI is essentially just very advanced statistics. And we use advanced statistics to understand unstructured data. So things like um, the content of an interview question, and we'll go on to that in a little moment. Okay, so another one of our takeaways, again, fairly straightforward, fairly obvious, but we just want to share this and make this kind of front and center really. So only consciously provided candidate data should ever be used to make hiring decisions. We all know this, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, um, but often, unfortunately, in the forms that our assessments take, the methods that we um, employ to, uh, to try and understand candidate potential for a role, very often skirts into proxies and forms of data that is unreliable in, in short. And what we also must do is make sure that candidates are ultimately in control of the information and that we are going to analyze as practitioners, as clients, as employers, whatever it may be, we need to make sure that they are clear on what is being used and why. I'm sure we've all got a few personal anecdotes and stories of, of assessment centers or things like that that we used to do face-to-face, -face, indeed, when we did those things kind of face-to-face -face, in which candidates were unsure um, you know, of, of what, the, what was being assessed, what was being looked at. We need to make sure we're being absolutely crystal clear. And we also need to make sure that our assessments are only picking up on the things we want them to. So what I would like to do is share a little bit more detail, add a bit of color and shade essentially to some of the things that we've been using at Modern Hire um, based on everything we've talked about thus far. So the issues um, with, with emerging technology, um, the need to provide greater clarity and the need to mitigate bias as well. What are some of the things that we've been doing? And what I'd like to do is just share with you what we refer to as our um, graduate virtual job tryouts. So our virtual job trial is, a, is a, an umbrella term for all of our assessments, but I'm going to be using an example of an early careers or an early careers specific assessment. 
that looks at some strong predictors of performance across a range of different apprentice and graduate opportunities, essentially. Okay, so what I do want to do firstly is just kind of really highlight what's the purpose of, of, of the virtual job trial that we are using. So as the name suggests, it's kind of a bit of a giveaway, um, but we are most interested in providing an assessment that is as close to a job samples assessment as humanly possible. Of course, practitioners on the call, you will be uh, more than aware that a job sample is typically the most single greatest predictor um, of, of performance from all the various forms of, of assessment that we may rely upon. So what we're trying to do is evaluate the multifaceted complex nature of human potential. Um, and we include a range of different assessments, including personality, bio data, and ad ad advanced simulations as well. In short, we're asking candidates to engage with exercises that mimic or mirror uh, the very real challenges that they would be expected to navigate if they were in role. And it allows for many different paths to success, bringing it back to the kind of the, the central focus of our conversation today, which is, of course is around driving diversity of a qualified candidate pool. So there isn't a one size fits all approach, but because we can automate the, the process, we can achieve a dynamic system that improves over time. We can constantly evaluate it. Uh, I mentioned a little earlier about our team of psychologists. One of the good things we can do is by having this, this um, sort of uh, pre-configured form of assessment, our uh, experts can go in and they can just evaluate and they can iterate and they can kind of tinker under the hood essentially to make, things, make sure things are working. And one of the things that we're interested in doing is creating, as you can see there, a two way exchange of information. If you think about the kind of the antiquated uh, days of assessment and, in, uh, and interviewing in particular, you know, you'd walk into a room and essentially you might get grilled as a, as a, as a, as a new graduate uh, by a hiring manager. And for the next hour, you just pray that you say the right things and hopefully land a job. Um, we're trying to move away from that as best as humanly possible. Um, and what we want to try and do is not only collect our, um, you know, data that is predictive of job performance, but we also want to be able to show the candidates what the role is all about and give them the means, the opportunity, the platform to really showcase their capability for the role as well. So that's where we get this idea of a two-way information exchange, a two-way street, if you like. Okay, so already mentioned a few of the things that we include in a, um, a, a virtual job tryout, but again, it goes back to what we were saying a little early. We don't want to put all of our eggs in one basket, so to speak. And unfortunately, many traditional methods that look at measures that look at one particular um, thing, be it a behavioral assessment or a psychometric, unfortunately, they, they inadvertently, by assessing only one, one kind of thing at a time, um, they immediately reduce down uh, their power of prediction. So what we do is we use a combined uh, multi-method or, or modal approach, um, which improves the overall predictive density of our assessments by combining different approaches into a holistic, well-rounded understanding of the candidates. This is what we refer to as the whole person model of talent. And you can see there, we do include things like relevant past experiences, but we're talking about graduate assessments here. And so we want to make sure that while this is a valuable metric, it's not the be all and end all. We want to make sure that we are opening the doors of opportunity to as many people as humanly possible. Okay. So what I'm going to do is just take a moment now just to break down a little bit more detail what we actually include in a graduate um, a virtual job trial. Um, again, there's a, quite a lot of information on screen there. So I'm going to take a few moments just to kind of read through that. Um, but what you can see, generally speaking, for running from left to right is what the candidate goes through step by step. Uh, we're using smartphones on screen just for the, de the purposes of this particular uh, sort of session today. Um, but everything you're seeing is accessible via smartphone, laptop, desktop, um, and, and doesn't require the download and installation of any apps or complex programs or anything like that. I'm sure, you can appreciate, um, you know, the moment you, in uh, you, you in include anything like that, any, any in you know, mandatory applications to be downloaded and installed, candidate uptake essentially just drops off a cliff. Um, and you can, it's, it's fairly obvious why. So what we do is we start on the left-hand side with what we, we refer to as a realistic job preview. 
So this isn't an assessed portion of the um, of the uh, the virtual job tryout, but what it does do is it provides candidates with insights into the actual role itself. You know what what are they getting involved in? What are they signing up for? Um, and it can include things like the challenges, very much the practical challenges of the role, be it um, you know difficult clients maybe or long hours, whatever it may be, um, as well as developmental opportunities. What could what could this role do for you in six months to a year, a year to two years, five years, ten years, etc sharing really the art of the possible um, but doing so in a practical well-grounded way it behaves very much like um, a self-selection questionnaire or an ssq um, but without the monotony of dozens and dozens of speculative questions even before a candidate has really started their application so it's at this point um, that the candidate can really work out if the role is is right for them ultimately um, we've done a lot of research into Candidate attrition. I think it, it was it was very um, it was wise to start exploring this topic in more detail because generally seeing and you may have this may speak to your experience as well. You may see this too. What we have seen in more recent years, um, I think, and and of course of COVID and and the, the sudden switch to remote working has certainly exacerbated this. Uh, we have seen a lot more people slowing down to take time in their lives to understand what it is that they want to be doing next. And as such, it's de developed into a general form of candidate scarcity, if you like. So rather than candidate abundance, a period of real scarcity. So what that means for us is. We need to make sure that any assessment that a candidate is going through, we need to make sure we're really clarifying what this is going to entail for them um, so they know that they can make the right decision. And indeed, from our research into candidate attrition, we see that there is a slight uptick in drop off at the very start. That much is to be understood. It is, it is completely understandable. Um, but what we can do is transfer this or translate this into a positive. There is such a thing as positive candidate attrition. And if candidates are deciding to drop out because this opportunity is well mapped out to them, but it's not for them, um, that's absolutely fine. I think the, the, the worst thing um, that we can possibly do, um, the kind of the, the bums in seats uh, mentality, if you excuse the phrase, which is getting candidates all the way through the process onboarding into a role and actually realizing this is not the role as it was described uh, this is not working for me i'm not really that interested so we provide candidates with the ability to understand more about the role the culture etc the challenges and then once they're happy with that they can hit next you can see in small writing in blue there and then they move through their assessed portion of the uh, the um uh, the vjt one of the things we also noted from our, our research into candidate attrition um, is the fact that candidates typically don't drop out during assessment. I know it's a completely understandable um, reservation that many recruitment managers that we speak to have. Um, this idea that if we make an assessment too long or whatever, the candidates will immediately start dropping off. What we tend to find is while we do have to pay attention to overall uh, assessment times, what we tend to find is candidates typically drop out between assessment stages. You know, very often we get these, you know, assessment campaigns consisting of five, six, seven, eight moving parts. And with, with COVID and the sudden shift to remote working, we had this kind of piecemeal and patchwork form of assessments that um, uh, various clients were, were using and prospects that we talked to. And, you know, they would say that we've got this telephone interview that's done manually. We've got this psychometric that goes out automatically, but we have to score it manually. This team does this, this team does that. And very often you get this kind of very staccato, very drawn out um, assessment campaign. And of course, candidates very quickly just start to drop through the cracks. So the reason I'm saying this is because this assessment, we essentially we just vertically integrated it. Everything you see, you start from you start from the realistic job preview and you just work all the way through it. You don't have to come out. You don't have to wait for any new links or anything like that. And we just make sure we're retaining the candidate's attention for the duration, ultimately. So the candidate then moves through a range of different assessments. Um, so you can see here handling work challenges, sort of about how they adapt essentially to novel situation. Collaborating with colleagues this is actually about decision making. It's, a, it's essentially a, a modernized, quicker, more effective way of doing the classic e-tray or in-tray activity where they have lots of information to have a look through and then they can just respond to a forced or multiple choice scenario for the ease of, of scoring ultimately. And then we move through to the tell us your story. We look at relevant experiences and also some personality measures as well at the end there. 
Finally, we finish with the in your own words section, which is um, an asynchronous or, or on demand style of interview. And we ask different. So we have a video interview question and we also have an email simulation or written response question. Both of these are scored using artificial intelligence or our approach to artificial intelligence, which is known as AIS. So automated interview scoring. And so we've talked a little bit about AI already and some of the perils of it, of it potentially. So what we wanna do is talk about a method that we find is far more reliable, trustworthy and able to speed up the assessment process um, for our recruitment managers and our clients. So everything you see throughout this process is automatically scored and we can provide candidate reports immediately, which is very helpful in, in this day and age. We need speed ultimately. Um, but when it comes to uh, uh, essentially evaluating and assessing unstructured responses. So interview responses, you can see on the right hand side there, um, that becomes a little bit more tricky without using artificial intelligence. So we are at Modern High incredibly conservative with the use of artificial intelligence. Um, and so we've developed a way in which we can use AI to help streamline, optimize and augment our process um, without um, blurring um, things or, or making less or suboptimal decisions. So we think of, if you think about for a second, the way that yourselves as, as practitioners on the call, um, as highly trained interviewers would conduct an interview, you would go into an interview room, you would ask a standardized question to a candidate, um, you would take full verbatim notes or there and thereabouts as best as you can, humanly possibly, before your wrist started to hurt. Um, you would then take those full verbatim notes away from the session and then you would evaluate the content of what has been said um, against standardized rating criteria or bars to go back to the point that Adam made a little earlier. Um, we do exactly the same thing with our AIS model. Essentially, the AI algorithm takes a transcript of what the candidate has said, not the way it's been said, not the mannerisms or the accents or anything like that, um, but what has been said takes that away with a high degree of accuracy and can score it using standardized rating criteria um, and provide an overall score. So we always like to, again, I, I mentioned a moment ago, we're incredibly conservative with its use and we like to use this kind of expression um, using AI like a highly effective intern. If you think about what an intern does, um, they work within a very tightly prescribed remit. Um, they are overseen by a more experienced, more expert individual um, who makes the executive decisions. And the intern just does that same task over and over again to the high, to the same familiar high standard of quality. We're using AI in the exact same way. And by mitigating a lot of those biases that naturally incur from face to face um, human interaction, you know, all those proxies, the like me, not like me biases, the affinity bias, the halo and horns, all this kind of stuff that will naturally come in during a face to face interview, we can control for a lot of that. And what we see from a candidate side of things as well, um, very positive, we're, we're rolling this out with some of our clients currently, and when it comes to um, candidate uh, opinions of this particular approach, um, we, we always provide candidates with an AI consent form, uh, of course, and we see a, between a 98.5% and a 99.5% candidate acceptance, so that many candidates are confirming they're happy to be assessed using AIS. Okay. Um, and these are just some of our findings uh, from our, the assessments that have used this approach, and these have informed the, the kind of the origins of our graduate VJT. Um, and you can see we're using various ROI metrics like um, you know, the quality of performance evaluations with somebody that's onboarded, ramp up speeds and supervisor ratings as well. Um, in the bottom left hand corner, you can see how um, we've, this has also been used taking interns who are on a part time um, form of work and then they've been converted to a full time uh, employee in FTE as well. But of course, we're here talking about bias. We're here talking about battling bias. So we also want to look at the spread of results that we can from a DNI perspective as well. Okay, so this is some work that our uh, colleagues in the US uh, carried out, uh, wherein scientifically developed tools, the, the VJT, we, as we mentioned, we use to provide candidates um, with the opportunity to really showcase their abilities. As I mentioned, in those highly work relevant tasks, the VJT, as you may have noticed, 
we're not drawing on things like their, um, you know, their CVs. We're not asking them um, always to draw on these very carefully manicured and curated experiences, which for obvious reason doesn't allow for um, uh, kind of equal opportunity in the, in the assessment process. It does advantage certain demographics. Um, so what we've done is we've drawn it. You can see some of the phrasing on the left hand side is of a particular American feel but the very sort of positive results there. You can see how by focusing on the things that really matter, by mitigating any proxies um, and by by allowing candidates the opportunity to really just showcase their capability whilst learning, we've been able to, in all instances except for one, increase the overall representation um, of various individuals from different demographic groups across all of these central verticals. Okay. And this uh, this graphic here, it's, it's quite a quite an interesting one. We call it a survival graph. I appreciate it is quite hyperbolic that phrasing. Don't worry, um, it's not quite the Hunger Games, but um, uh, I'll grant you. But this particular slide, what we're showcasing is, as you can see on the left hand side, um, sort of zero months on the job and moving uh, through to their first year. Um, we're looking at people hired firstly before a VJT assessment was introduced. That's the black line there you can see, or the black slope, and then you can see after a VJT was uh, was used with one of our um, clients working in, in major retail. And you can see um, the turnover for the, the individuals being assessed by maybe more an antiquated methods, should we say, the turnover tends to be quicker. And so at the end of those 12 months, you see only 54% of people were still enrolled. So that's only just over one in two, only just. But when we look at the VJT, um, which helps with the hiring of people and fitting of people by clarifying what the role entails, we're, we're, we're seeing some positive results. We've, we're seeing people are far more likely to stay and 70% of people are still there um, just over that, which is a 17 point difference. So it's not magic or anything like that. Um, it's just science. Essentially, we're developing and revisiting this approach time and time and time again with a ton of data. Uh, and we're just trying to make sure that we can predict who is likely to stay, who's likely to fit in, in, in the kind of that, that, that two way sense of the word. You know, is this a role that's right for candidates and are they going to have the ability to really showcase their capabilities as well? Um, and of course, this brings us on to the most important part of today's conversation, which is, is it going to help us increase that overall diversity? Which brings me on to our next section now. Uh, Moo. So <laughs> multiple outcome optimization sounds very complicated and Moo sounds very simplistic. So I'm going to try and hit somewhere in the middle if I can. Um, we've talked a lot about algorithms and AI and things like that. But one of the things that I'm particularly interested in using is, is this, 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 this Moo model, which allows us to improve predictive power, but also fairness in the, in the hiring solution as well. The best way I can think of describing Moo is like a big sound mixing board. If you think about, you know, you, you're recording music or anything like that. I know Adam on the call is very much into his music. Um, me personally, far less talented. Um, but, you know, you think about all these different mixes that you can move up and down, you can dial up, you can dial down different frequencies and things like that. Because we use a multi-method assessment with all these various um, f facets, uh, predictive qualities, we can emphasize or de-emphasize certain elements to get the best possible weighted combination of predictors. And that way we can focus on different ROI metrics, whether it's diversity and fairness, turnover prediction, both of them at the same time, um, or overall predictive power. And so we've got some really good results of using Moo um, to increase both prediction and fairness. Um, we've seen some great increases in ROI from a purely a bottom line standpoint. Um, and we've got some information on that if anyone after the call is interested in learning a bit more. But we've also been able to use it to improve the overall diversity makeup um, of organizations, in particular female hiring. Some really interesting results from that, as well as ethnic minority hiring too, uh, which is fantastic. Okay, so Appreciate I've been talking for quite some time, so I'm going to pass over to, to Adam to give you all a, a much needed break. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Simon. Yeah, and just to wrap up, really, um, just wanted to highlight again that, you know, we've take a very conservative and ethical approach to AI. You know, we don't have it in our toolkit just because it's shiny and um, we can sell it. We don't even have it just because it makes our clients' lives easier. We have it because we genuinely believe it um, leads to fairer outcomes. It's also the right thing for the candidate. Um, you know, we've talked about the fact that we take a glass box approach as opposed to a black box approach. And what we mean there is that it's easy to explain. So it's easy for us to explain it to you. 
it's easy for you to explain it to the business and to any regulators and, and of course, to candidates. Um, and the fact that we explain it so clearly um, and still get a very high consent rate um, is, is a positive sign. So, you know, we've written this white paper, which highlights six principles that we believe is how to do hiring um, AI ethically. Um, and this is what we hold ourselves to. You know, legislation is emerging, spearheaded in the US, but there's new legislation coming along in the UK um, and EU in, in the near future. And we actually welcome this legislation, you know, because we took that conservative and ethical approach from the outset, um, then there, there's nothing in these laws that that, that worries us. Um, we're not having to do a sudden pivot or anything like that. Um, so, you know, that brings us on to, you know, the final takeaway, um, really, which is, you know, AI done badly can potentially cause bias, um, but AI done appropriately, and that means, you know, with the necessary safeguards, and importantly, with accurate, reliable and valid assessment of core competencies can also be the solution to bias. Thanks very much, Adam. So what I'm going to do, I appreciate we've got about 15 minutes. Um, so what I'm going to do is just ask Stephen to rejoin um, the, the, the conversation today, because I understand we're going to have the opportunity for a bit of Q&A. And I can see there already are a few questions in the chat and Q&A function. There are. Um, first of all, Simon and um, Adam, thanks. That was really informative. Um, um, very interesting um, um, session with lots to lots to digest. Um, let's get stuck straight into Q and A. We've got a couple of questions in at the moment. Um, but as Simon said, we've got a um, we've got what time we at? Yeah, we've got a quarter of an hour. So um, if you've got any questions, please pop them in there, and I'll put them put them to Simon and Adam. So the first question is, um, and you mentioned actually the BBC documentary that was, that was out a while ago that I remember watching. Um, um, somebody's also mentioned um, there's a recent article by the BBC. Um, 13th of October and the question is actually how do you ensure that bias is not built into the selection algorithm and specifically that question around actually the team that's creating the algorithm within your organization itself any any thoughts or comments on that yeah certainly I mean the first thing I would say is I unfortunately haven't had the opportunity to read um, the particular article myself personally but I will absolutely add that to my homework um, as soon as we finish the, the the conversation today but what we do is we didn't go into too much detail when it came to the algorithm I'll grant you but um, Adam mentioned the kind of the, the philosophical or theoretical approach that we have to take which is to establish a, a glass box um, approach to the use of AI and that what that means is we can see straight through it essentially it's got to be purely transparent um, at all times. Um, and so the way that we do that, make sure we're not building any bias, is being able to ensure that anything, a um, anything an algorithm is providing us, we're able to understand how it's drawn that conclusion and where it's come from. One of the biggest problems that we saw early on with the use of AI as an, an emerging technology was, um, again, kind of going back to what I said earlier about false positives, very often an AI algorithm would work on a particular candidate score, maybe it's we'll use facial recognition example, and it would give you an answer, it would give you a result, but you weren't clear on how that result had been arrived at. So it gave you, it gave you something, but you're not clear how. Um, we think about the use of AI in the same way we think about some of the legislation that emerges around assessment centers and things like that. We know that candidates can ask um, to see any information that is recorded about them. So very often, if you've got, and I'm sure, you know, um, people on the call will have, will have experienced this themselves. You have a candidate who's maybe upset with the, the overall decision. And so your recruiters have to go back to the overall score, find the um, verbatim notes that were taken and the evaluation that was given and backdate it. This is what you said, and this is what we arrived at. We have to do exactly the same thing with our AI models. We have to be able to show this is what's been appraised using NLP normally, and this is what's been arrived at. If we can do that, we can ensure that we are maintaining that glass box approach. And in order to make sure that we can do that at the very source as well, is we have to constantly validate, constantly go in um, and test and test and test over and over again. Um, I'd love to hear from the individual um, who asked the question because we do have some interesting uh, pieces on the way in which we go about building our algorithms, if that would be of any interest. I've got my email um, address at the end in just a moment, so perhaps we can continue the conversation there. I hope that helps. Um, I appreciate it. it's quite a, quite a whistle-stop summary. 
Yeah, it does. Um, uh, definitely. Um, just out of interest, do you think there's still quite a high degree of misunderstanding, both amongst employers, amongst students, amongst everybody actually in our industry, around what AI truly is and the difference between what is AI and what's simply just, you know, um, I guess, you know, something that's driven by by data analytics? Yeah, I, I, th I think um, you're absolutely right. We do a lot of work with various information houses and various analysts to understand the state of the market. Um, and one of the things we're seeing is, is a lot of, uh, I won't name names, but, um, you know, you've got some industry professionals, uh, information houses, let's say, who very often are approached uh, by organizations using AI. And it turns out to just be a, a very sophisticated search engine or something like that. It's not quite um, what we mean. You know, there has to be a, a machine learning um, aspect to it. So there is a lot of uncertainty in the industry. It is a nascent technology. Um, and many of you may have seen, like, say, just as an example, Gartner's hype cycle around the use of, of AI too. I do think there are reservations. I think generally speaking, there are concerns. Um, I think recruitment uh, teams in particular, um, and I understand that. I understand whenever it comes to using new tools and technology, there are always a level of uh, reticence or reluctance. Um, but the only way we do that is be, by being more transparent in our approach, not more opaque. So I think the, you know, Adam's already mentioned about how we are trying to contribute to AI uh, legislation and understanding as best we can. And we indeed welcome the changes. But I think every organization um, that's, that's kind of entered into this this uh, kind of uh, realm, if you like, this kind of uh, uh, this ring um, has to be able to demonstrate that glass box approach. That would be a great step forwards. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, I think we're seeing a lot of positives from candidates. Candidate perception seem to be very positive. And I think there is this sense that when done right, um, AI can help mitigate bias, you know, Again, I, it's, I struggle to, to phrase it appropriately, but um, you know, many of us are aware that traditional methods of assessment, assessment centers, the classic paper and pen approach, the unstructured, semi-structured, and even structured interviews, many people are aware that these invite bias and things like that. And again, not to um, you know, call on the malevolence or anything like that of, of, of recruitment managers, it's more to do with, I've got to assess 50 people today. I've got to go through 150 interviews. When things are configured like that manually, there's no way you can you can control for bias, but AI might be a solution to that. Got it. Cool. Um, just going to some uh, more questions here. So I've got a question from Sam. Um, Sam's saying from a, a student, um, so uh, Sam's talking about giving advice to students, graduates, et cetera, um, and saying it would be good to highlight any employers which are currently using VJT method. Um, have you got any that you can talk about or is there a way that actual um, people can find out or easy to spot it in terms of employers talking about who, um, who use this kind of approach? Well, thank you, uh, Sam, for, for your question. Um, no, that's a really, really fair one. So um, the, the VJT is, is, is a modern hire product and of course, um, it would always be it would always be linked to us, but of course we do work with lots of different organisations. So it may be um, that you that you you, you will encounter a, a virtual job trial. What I would say I couldn't I couldn't give you exact names here and now, but what I would say is that typically speaking, when it comes to graduate assessments, you've got a you've got a um, uh, a kind of a, a mixed bag when it comes to the assessments that are being used. Very often you see things like telephone interviews, um, assessment centers are still very much relied upon um, and they're quite common. You sometimes get psychometrics to be invited to as well. Um, and you also have quite a strong degree of um, gamification. So these are assessments that draw on gamify, gamify forms of assessment that assess various components as well. Um, so, you are going to see a lot of variation. I dare say those are the things that you're going to going to uh, bump into, if you like, uh, when it comes to sort of uh, looking for graduate or student positions. Um, and I think beyond that, um, I couldn't, as I said, I couldn't answer your your question head on and just mm. sort of give you give you a list. Um, but those are the kind of things that you typically look out for. But what I would say is there is a general movement now towards more. Uh, potential based kind of questions and things like that and assessments that look for those transferable qualities so drawing on your experiences and things like that um, I hope that helps sorry I appreciate it. it's quite a broad question I've done my best <laughs> Adam, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add to that well just to add to that so I mean some of our clients are you know more secretive than than others and we don't always have the you know permission to talk about them publicly but we we do have quite a few case studies on 
the website with with name clients so you'll be able to see some um on there cool thanks a lot um we can di direct people there at the um, um at the at the end or if you want to pop it in the chat adam or simon then please feel feel free to do that um and just a question following on from that actually that I had, I read an article in the FT, oh, it was a couple of weeks ago, um, talking about, it was in their working career section, talking about actually the use of, it was more generally around the use of assessment techniques that weren't driven by somebody's previous experience. Um, and I thought that was quite interesting because I thought actually um, our sector, student recruitment, has been using these techniques for well, well, they're getting more sophisticated, but that basic principle, whereas your previous work obviously can't, you know, be used as a guide for the work you're going to do in, do in, the, in the future. Do you see this kind of technique also actually um, bleeding through into more experienced, higher kind of um, arenas? So actually, is it something that, that all of us are going to get more used to seeing, um, you know, if we're ever applying for, for jobs in, outside the student space? I think from a, a personal standpoint I would I kind of very much appreciate that I think uh, it's that classic thing uh, we did a webinar previously on this kind of the origins of the, the approach to assessment which very much comes straight from the industry line essentially you know if you think about you know, I think we use an example of like the Henry Ford plant or something like that um, wherein we you know assessments were driven by this idea that your employee is going to need to do just a fixed role very very tightly prescribed and just do it over and over again um, a bit like that intern analogy we use and of course the, the world of work has completely changed but it meant that all of our understanding of assessments was this idea of use past performance as an indicator of future performance that might make sense if you're working on an industry line you've done it before you can do it again um, but unfortunately as, as the world of work becomes far more complicated not to mention adding the complexity of the fact that graduates don't have a past experience of, or at least a work uh, experience to draw upon uh, that raises some interesting challenges um i can't remember the, the research off the top of my head and there was a team of researchers that looked at the relationship between um past work experience and prediction in role and they found no significant correlation i've got the white paper i've got the research on that so if anyone was interested please do reach out to me afterwards but showed that even in experience hires even when the role was really closely aligned in terms of what they did previously and what they're expected to do not a particularly good predictor so hopefully things will change and will instead of going from the top downwards and, and trying to sculpt graduate assessments on what's been done um, originally we'll go the other way and hopefully we'll start informing upwards yeah i think as the world of work changes the 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 roles change ever more rapidly that's going to become even more important and um, just conscious of time we've got some more questions still coming through so uh question from eloise um um how do you explain the the hiring decrease of black people in banking in the banking field in one of the diagrams that you that you use simon yeah eloise that's, that's a really fair question i don't have that, the research to to hand unfortunately what, what we can do is we can certainly provide you with our insights. I think um, Eric, I mentioned Dr. Eric Seidel, who, who presided over that um, particular research, would, would happily reach out and explain that in more detail. Um, so it was a few percentage points, as I understand. Um, and what we could do is we could provide you with a breakdown. I think there was some follow up, some, so, so some qualitative information was retained as well, um, that we could happily share. Um, you know, it, it's gen generally quite quite positive, I think, the, the results that we could see, um, but it would be really interested in, in, in exploring that. And that's one of the things that our team of, of, of psychologists is doing presently. Um, so what we can do is, uh, Eloise, we'll take, take your information and we can get you some more info your way. Great, thank you. Um, and uh, another question come through here. Um, any advice to SMEs that may not necessarily have the budget to implement AI? Because of course, you know, we have, there are big recruitment teams within the IAC membership, but then also actually there are um, employers that actually have relatively small operations. So so any, any thoughts or comments on the budget that you need to implement um, these kind of um, processes? Um, yeah, I, I think it's, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a fair question because Typically, you do see, um, Adam, I'll bring it in a moment, I don't know if you have any thoughts on this, but um, typically we do see um, that the assessment side of things does require slightly larger budget than some, some of the other things that we, we provide, like uh, asynchronous interviews and things like that. Um, so it, it is a consideration. I know that not everybody can reach into it. Um, but what I would say is I think that there's a lot of very interesting products being provided in the market. And I would say that if you're budgeting for one particular um, particular thing or opportunity, I would I would always explore first and foremost the predictive power of whatever you're using. You know, a lot of companies are using um, you know the, the traditional antiquated methods. COVID moved a lot of those paper-based things 
onto a more of a digital platform and that worked for a lot of organizations, but it did create other problems. Um, it wasn't an issue from a financial standpoint, but it was in terms of candidate uptake and things like that. All I would say is if AI is, is kind of off limits from a budgetary standpoint, then think about the approaches you are using, what can be done to tighten up or shore up um, the predictive power, the reliability uh, and consistency of the assessment methods that you're using. Um, Adam, I don't know if you've got anything else you wanted to add to that. Yeah, it's just thinking about budgets. And I mean, one of the things that we've done with quite a lot of clients is that, that helps them draw a really strong connection between the investment they've made in hiring tech and then real business metrics. Um, you know, and those metrics will be different for every single client. But, you know, we're talking about on the job performance and staff retention, really. And I forget, I can't remember off the top of my head, but there was a report in the last week or so um, looking at what chief executives think are the main issues moving forward and recruitment and retention were, um, I think, right at the top of the list, I think, or if not, certainly very close to the to the top. So, you know, obviously there's not always going to be endless budgets and all the rest of it, but but sometimes being able to draw those connections with not just recruitment efficiencies, but also actually improving the bottom line of the company um, can, can unlock additional budget. Um, I think we've got time for one more question just before we finish, um, which is um, how about gaming the um, the interviews by using um, buzzwords? So could candidates just sort of load up an interview? We get a load of list of words from, um, you know, from a HR dictionary and, um, and, um, and use those. What, what, how does the system get around that? Yeah, the, the algorithm is looking at the form that the sentence takes. So if you were just to include um, the, the buzzwords alone, it, it wouldn't work. Um, particularly well I don't, I, um, and I think what we do is we use three broad criteria um, in which the AI system wouldn't wouldn't approach an answer wouldn't wouldn't try and tackle it again continuing on from what we talked about from that that black box versus glass box approach um, which is if an answer is too short or it's incoherent so if you just included buzzwords or short um, kind of very staccato sort of sentences or things like that it would it would identify that and report it back to a, to the hiring manager ultimately um, and then you'd have to manually manually go through and have a look but yeah it's, it's a fair it's a fair question there's always going to be um, uh, that 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 tendency to try and game a system and so we have to make sure that we're presenting questions in a way where um, firstly candidates are actually more interested in showcasing their abilities the in your own words thing is is um, it's really asking candidates to to talk about themselves as best as humanly possible to give that free form answer um, and a, and, and a, a, a response that demonstrates those transferable skills in plenary would be scored much more highly than somebody that just added in a few kind of HR uh, catchphrases and, and, and cliches, so to speak. Fantastic. Great. Excellent. We're, we're on the hour. So um, perfect timing. Thank you very much, Simon, Adam. Really useful and informative session. Lots of lots of questions. And I'm sure this is a subject we're going to keep returning back to as, as technology changes and advantage and, and uses develops. Um, I pulled out a stat from our um, own survey that came out last week, and it showed at the moment that um, just 9% of ISE employer members are, are using AI at the moment. So we do expect to see that, that grow significantly. Adam, you and I go back way back, don't we, with the introduction of video interviews which started at pretty low percentage but very very quickly got to um over 50 60 70 percent of employers using it so mm -hmm. i'm sure we'll sure we'll see the same here um simon and adam have put their um their emails there so you can get hold of um um, you can get hold of them there. Um, if you want to follow up on any of the stuff we talked about, it please recommend you to do that. Um, again, my thanks, um, Simon and Adam, for um, for partnering with us. Um, it's the content that you guys provide that really enable us to bring um, good sessions to our members. Um, as I said at the very start, um, we have recorded this. You will get a link to the recording, so you can go back and pick up anything that you want to recap. Also, please please feel free to share that link because we do like to um, spread the knowledge around the industry. So thank you very much. Um, hope the rest of the day stay dry. Sun's actually down here in London is coming out a little bit now after a rainy morning. So hope it's all the same for you. Um, Simon, Adam, fun. Thanks from me. Um, see you all soon. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye bye.